Um, <laughs> now I'm being recorded. Oh, well, <laughs> I don't really care for what I say. No. <laughs> okay, um, so and I think what I heard you share, too, is that just kind of your observation and what has worked in the community is really community presence to kind of de-escalate when when that's necessary, when it's something that doesn't necessarily arise to the level of a hospitalization or something to that level. But then another suggestion is that when an individual does have to be diverted to a hospital or clinical setting, then could there be legal representatives who just kind of are on call there who can make some recommendations or um, or actions on behalf of that individual in the event that they are clinically, emotionally unable to make those decisions for themselves? Something very straightforward, very quick, something that can be done very quickly, not wait, you know, three or four days until you can get a hold of a judge to sign off on something and again, then go through five or six court hearings with 15 attorneys representing who, who else is involved. Just something very quick, very straightforward. Um, after that, there needs to be some sort of integration of things so people aren't left hanging, you know, how do I get to the next step in the process? It needs to be flexible enough so that people can go to who they need to go to. And if they have a provider that they don't think they're getting along with, they can switch to another provider. But there needs to be some sort of kind of handover from one state, from the crisis stage to the next stage, the outpatient stage, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously funding is a big problem because people who are dependent on Medicaid, they might get six visits and then they're dumped Six visits just isn't enough for most problems that people have. Absolutely, you're right. Um, so, and so I think we have it as far as the notes, but just to make sure we recap so that we hear everything. Another part of it is making sure that our, our kind of our warm handoffs and coordination of care is actually just that. So that we're not really sending people, discharging them into the community with no real support. Um, so it's straightforward, but it's flexible to meet each person's need and give them some autonomy. Um, and again, to advocate for more funding, especially for individuals who receive um, state insurance. So yeah. thank you if for you that. How to do that? It would be wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. We have Deborah and Nitch. Wait, hello, Deborah. How are you? And and Nitch, right? Did I say that right? Hello. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm sorry we inadvertently signed up to speak, but we are just listeners. But thank you so much, and you know, we wholeheartedly support the effort. No problem. Your support is what's needed as well. Thank you for that. Actually, I have a quick question, though. Um, I don't know that I have any. Um, advice to offer as a community member, but I just kind of assumed that the Marcus Alert program would look something similar to the CAHOOTS program, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to know how similar would some of those um, initiatives be? I don't know, should I defer, I'm gonna defer to you, Lee? I don't wanna speak on behalf of. Yeah, I can, um, I can take that. Yeah, so that is a program that's come up a lot. I think, you know, the short answer is some communities might look a lot like that and others um, might look like some of the different ones, but that is the, um, a lot of components of that are very consistent with the concept of a community care team. And so I, I, um, I definitely think that that there's that similarity there and that the state plan would absolutely allow for things like that. And um, I, I would think that that is, um, you know, localities are going to be looking at directions like that. Thank you for that. I was like, oh, I don't want to answer anything on behalf of the state. <laughs> Before disclosure, we really do want this to be a true community event and discussion. So um, it's not so formal. So we just want everyone to know that. So we're being very intentional with making sure we model that for everyone as well. You may hear a child run by me or something, you may see a kid. I, don't, I can't control any of that that's going to happen in here today. We have Joe Stafford. I'm Joe Stafford. I'm a peer recovery specialist, a uh, person with lived experience with OECOs, TDOs, and uh, it's been about four and a half years in and out of mental hospitals. Um, I work on the crisis intervention team for the Rapp Rappahannock Area Community Services Board, and I normally work um, at Mary Washington Hospital. Um, 
So the current policy in our area, I know that different areas do it differently, but in our area, the policy is that if a person is under an ECO, that they must have at least one um, the handcuff attaching them to the bed for the entire ECO process, which is cruel and inhumane. Um, and, and I feel is a violation of our human rights. Um, things are, have improved until 2018. It was still legal to hold people down uh, and force them to give labs, um, blood and catheters and, and all of that. And, and, and that has improved, right? That's no longer uh, legal to do unless a, a doctor says they're incompetent, um, which very few doctors have the time to mess with. Um, and uh, the other thing is, is I've, I've gone voluntarily to the hospital. It's been 10 years since I've been inpatient anywhere, um, but the process takes too long, right? You know, um, it is not uncommon, especially for volunteers to be there 12, 14, 18, uh, you know, I've seen some there 72 hours, right? Uh, waiting for assessment or uh, bed placement. Um, and they are discouraged from leaving their, their rooms, right, uh, at the ER. Um, you know, the two things I see that cause the most AMAs uh, against medical advice leaving, uh, the first is how much time it takes to, to be assessed, right? Yeah. Um, and the, the second is uh, smoking, right? I, I could keep a lot of people at the hospital if they would just leave, let them have a cigarette, um, you know? And uh, uh, the, the other thing that I, well, I'm just gonna let, let that be that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, first things, thank you for sharing your personal experience. We, we really do appreciate that and hearing that and holding a space for that. Um, and that's important. We always, we wanna share that for anyone, especially who's sharing um, a personal interaction or personal interactions that, that you've had with our system of care. Um, and I think you, you, and then as a peer recovery specialist, we appreciate the work that you are doing. And to make sure that we're just recapping it correctly, two of the concerns are, um, one of the biggest ones is just the, the lengthy amount of time it takes for the assessment process and how that can be not to add more to what you're saying, but that can be triggering and, and traumatizing, which can sometimes result in a person discharging themselves from the hospital um, against medical advice. And so that is there a way to shorten that admissions and assessment process so that a person is not waiting so long um, to be assessed? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then the second one is when individuals are denied smoke, you know, opportunities to smoke, et cetera, is there something that could be done in regards to that? Um, yeah, those are two issues as far as um, what part of what makes the, the experience miserable, right? But but more importantly is the handcuff policy. That's what I was going to go to. Right. So I make sure I heard those two. And then the the initial concern that was verbalized and also put in the chat was that um, under and, and getting clarification is if this is allow, if this is standard practice in all hospitals, all crisis admissions. I, I know that it's not. I know that some areas have the ability to lock rooms. I mean, I, there's some logistical reasons yeah. uh, for it, uh, but I have very good law enforcement officers, right? That, that work the CIT and, um, you know, many of them have really good instincts. Uh, I think that the handcuffs should only be involved if a person is in immediate danger to themselves or to others, or is going to, you know, uh, try to leave, right? Um, you know, but most of the people that I work with, it, it, it's very unnecessary uh, for them to be handcuffed while they're under an ECO. Uh, they're mostly compliant. They might be loud, but they're mostly compliant and they're not in immediate danger to themselves or other people. You can't even do that in, in, in a um, mental hospital. You can't handcuff a person eight hours. Um, before, right before COVID, I had, uh, I worked till nine. I had a 13 year old and a 17 year old 
And they'd been there a few hours before I left. And I got back the next day at noon and they were still handcuffed, right? You know, so they were handcuffed almost 20 hours. And the 17 year old was definitely a danger to himself and others, right? You know, but the 13 year old, right? You know, it was no danger to anybody. And, and, and it's just wrong, right? It's, it's wrong and, and it's inhumane. Uh, you can only do that to people with mental illness. Um, thank you for that, um, for just sharing that experience and, and what's occurring in that particular area. And so we have that recorded and just noted as, as you know, discussions for a part of the plan. I appreciate you sharing the uh, both professional and personal experience. Much appreciated. I, I have law enforcement officers, right? Uh, they have enough judgment, right? You know, uh, and, and some of them have souls and they have hearts, right? And if a person is, is not, um, you know, dangerous, right? You know, then they, they will release the handcuffs, but their jobs are on the line every time they do that because the policy is quite clear that they will be handcuffed, right, for the entire time that they're under an ECO. Now, I, I would just like the, pro, the, the the wording to change a little bit so it could be up to the officer's discretion. Um, Thank you for that. Okay. And so just some officer discretion with that part. I appreciate that. Thank you for giving that clarity to us and some suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. We have Charles now. Hi, Charles, how are you? I think we just need to unmute you one second. Hang on, I think we got, we got okay. it. Um, I just came as a listener, but um, I, sure, I certainly appreciate everything I've heard so far. But one thing that did come to me uh, that would be involved uh, probably with law enforcement is that uh, I, um, I'm from the uh, Norfolk area, and um, I heard on the radio that the Portsmouth Police Department just lowered their age for police officers to enter their training at 18 years old. Um, the first thing that came from me on that, that announcement was executive level functioning. I think that uh, most, well, from my understanding, most people don't get their executive level functioning developed until they're about in their mid twenties, maybe something earlier than that, but most of them around 25. So, you know, much of our police force, I think is, is young, young, young adults. And so I think that uh, some assessment of one's executive level functioning and working with the mental health uh, would be an important criteria. I don't know how you go about uh, analyzing or diagnosing that, but I would like to see that um, people who are young, you know, do they have the executive level functioning to actually engage with someone who is uh, at best the most difficult to deal with when they're having a breakdown? Um, and, uh, you know, they, so they would probably just respond quickly emotionally and are just not capable, I don't think capable of maturely handling uh, someone who's having a real uh, distress in their life. So that's all I have to say, thanks. Thank you for that. So just a, a suggestion of, is there a way that we can assess um, emotional regulation and uh, executive functioning? Because we're, we're sending officers, law enforcement, et cetera, into the community to work with the vulnerable population, but there may be just some development that just by living longer um, kind of comes along with that. Okay. Yeah, and then one other one that come to me is uh, maybe some training in um, so the diversity that I see probably for most of what I see in the mental health industry where serious injuries occur is I just think there's some kind of training on white privilege uh, that could uh, you know, really get people, especially the people who are uh, white, just uh, how do you really assess your white privilege and how does that impact your ability to serve a community that is diverse? So also that would be something. Absolutely. 
Thank you. So not only assessing for officers, but also training and in the community, knowing that these trainings are existing as well. Right. Um, with, and uh, uh, to use your words, training on something like white privilege. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. All right. Thank you. Everyone has really great, this is important to hear from the community. Hmm. Sorry. This we have Brian Kelmar. Hi, Brian. How are you? Hi, good. There we go. Video. Hi, Brian Kelmar. Um, my concern is um, we talk a lot about mental health, and there's a lot. It seems to me there's like a lot more people trained in mental health, and not as many people trained in developmental disabilities like autism. Um, we have CIT training, which is what forty hours, and of that forty hours, you may get a couple hours in some of the training in developmental disabilities. My concern is we're probably running into more situations where people have developmental disabilities like autism and may be mistaken as uh, mental illness, that they're having a, an, a, an attack of some sort when it's nothing more than basically an autistic having a mental breakdown, having his way or her way of how they're handling the situation and it gets interpreted. So my concern is <clears throat> how are we gonna make sure that we have people that are trained in this area that when the calls are come in, and we may not even know whether they're mental illness or whether developmental disabilities, that we're having the right response team show up. Thank you for that, Brian. So making sure, not just that when we're doing trainings, not just on individuals with mental illness, but individuals with our in our ID or developmentally delayed population, and making sure we're able to understand the difference between the two. You know, yes. because a person who is living with autism may present like they're having an emotional crisis that we assign under the mental health side, but it's really needing training for the IDDD community um, and making sure that we're actually giving more training to that, not just kind of a catch all under right. the CIT training. So being very deliberate and intentional with separating the training so that we're really able to receive an equal amount, if, if I'm thinking I'm hearing you. Yeah, I just, wanna, um, you know, we hear a lot of crisis intervention teams, and I've had a parent, um, I'm the chairman of uh, Legal Reform for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, and we had a parent where a CIT person showed up and went, well, I don't know, there's not much I can help him with. And the person was, I don't know, maybe got an hour training on autism, and then what the kid was having was, was basically having a, you know, a mental freeze. He was having an autistic situation, and they went, oh, it's mental health and obviously he needs something else. The concern is if you put a person with autism into a mental health uh, issue by treating with drugs or, or whatever, you're actually making things worse mm -hmm. and you're gonna make it long-term um, very traumatizing instead of de-escalating. And that's the purpose of this bill is to de-escalate things and not escalate it. And that's, that's my concern that we address that. Absolutely. And thank you for the work that you are doing um, as well and really giving a voice to, to families and communities that sometimes this is difficult to navigate along with navigating life as well. Um, yes. And recognizing where, and I'm, I'm all often very transparent that I am an LPC, but that does not mean that I'm always the best person to assist with the IDDD population. And I need to make sure that I don't re-traumatize and connect with the person who is operating within their scope. So I think that's really important to convey so that we're able to, to make sure we honor both demographics because both demographics are vulnerable. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you. We appreciate that. We have Pam. Hi, Pam, how are you? I think you have to unmute, Pam. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Well, my situation is a little complex. I have a son that's 39 years old. He was hospitalized, it was approximately six months ago. 
he was diagnosed at 18 with uh, Asperger's syndrome, high functioning autism. And he also was diagnosed a little later with paranoid schizophrenia, which he does um, go into psychosis from time to time. And my mother did have it. So it's almost evident that that is the case, but it's also very evident that he does have high functioning autism. He has meltdowns. When he went in the hospital this last time, he had completely tore up his whole room, you know, through the meltdown. And he does have them from time to time, but he's heavily medicated now and he's more calm. He has a very sad life. But the last time he went, he left with handcuffs and he was really going to go on his own. But I think when they saw the condition of his room, they more or less just convinced him. They said, you know, to go TDO. So he had handcuffs in the hospital ER room. Both hands were handcuffed. His feet were handcuffed. Due to COVID, I was surprised that they even let me go in, but I was there to be his advocate. The police officer uh, was sitting outside the room, and from time to time, my son would just start pulling so hard after, this was like after we were there two days, just pulling so hard that he made marks on his wrist, and I said, can't you loosen them, please? And he would not have said anything himself. He would have just kept on and probably cut his wrist doing it. His ankles had places about two months from the cuffs being on him. Now, like I say, that is devastating in itself. Watching him, he wasn't going to get up and do anything at that point. He would have, he would have just laid there probably. And, but to have four, his feet shackled and his hands was very traumatizing to begin with. And I agree with the previous you know, caller that said the handcuff situation. It's just so sad to see them go through that. And another thing that needs to happen, like you were speaking about designating, is it autism? Is it mental health? But Joey, again, is so complex, it's even hard for us, his, my, his mother, to know what's going on at times. But to have somebody that understands autism to help these autistic, the autistic population, like my sister is a psychiatric nurse, and she says that you will be given pushback in hospitals when they hear it's autism, because they don't want to deal with maybe them breaking things when they're taken into the hospital. I know Tennessee has started a program for, you know, the intellectually, you know, disabled people. Yeah, and yeah. we need more like that in Virginia. They closed down a lot of state hospitals. These people are just turned away to go home and either commit suicide or, or I, I'm on autistic support groups on Facebook. You, the things that I read on there are so heart wrenching. People are living in homes with holes or in walls where the kids have had meltdowns and things. We need more help especially for the autistic population. It seems like more and more have autism now. And it's just devastating. And um, I mean, I've done a lot of work when I worked with the insurance agencies, reaching out in care management to people that, you know, need help and things. And it's just so sad. They're like out there with not much support. And I'm 69 years old now. And I worry about what will happen to my son when I saw him handcuffed to the bed. And if I hadn't have been there to say, hey, can't you just loosen it up just a little and stuff? He would have laid there no telling what permanent marks he would have. So that's my main concern. More, more awareness of autism, more awareness, you know, of mental illness, more help, more maybe specialized hospitals for that population where mental health comes out and not police officers, nothing against police officers, but maybe mental health say, hey, yeah, this person does need to go to our specialized place. So that's my thoughts. Absolutely. First thing, again, thank you so much for sharing um, just your personal experiences and that and that of your son as well. Um, I can speak on behalf, I know the entire group that we, you know, these are things that when we hear that we are impacted. And, and so um, thank you for sharing that and, and for speaking up for other individuals who may not be able to do that or have not been able to do that. And so a few suggestions of, can there be some specialized hospitals? Can there be trained mental health providers who are able to come out um, instead of law enforcement and working with the, our population that's living with autism um, and you know, to be handcuffed, and, does this need to last this long? This, that sounded, I think you said you were at day two when that was occurring yes. of ankle 
restraints and wrist restraints. And and it just it just so happened Northern Virginia, we had to send him all the way from Richmond to Northern Virginia to get help because of the pushback with autism. People not and the shortage of beds due to COVID, but also when they hear autism, it's like no way we want to deal with that population. Right. And so to make sure that too is is that it is really important that we don't have providers who are turning away a person right. who is experiencing a crisis based upon a diagnosis. And I, you won't be able to see this part because it's sent to the panelists, but one of the committee members um, did say that Pam needs to speak to the General Assembly, very powerful, and she appreciates your passion for your son and for others. So I wanted to make sure I said that publicly so that you heard that. I echo that comment that was made as well, a, a very passionate, um, very, very passionate um, communication. How, and so I, how would I, I be able to do that? Is there, well, I mean, would I know a date or a time that I could speak to the General Assembly? You can connect with the Arc of Virginia. Uh, okay. We'd be happy to. So if you just want to email um, info at the arc of va.org, we'd be happy to, to help you with that. And actually, okay. you help us with that. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Is there, you put that in the chat. Too, yes, so I was getting ready to ask. Hey, yeah. see that. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you all. Bless no, we appreciate you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And this is one of the important parts of the community engagement, you know, community listening sessions is that we receive some information and you receive some as well in, in real time. And so um, I think we were able, well, we're recording it, but we were also able to write down just what those, um, you know, um, concerns are and also the suggestions um, as well. And then one of them, are there any soft restraints to use or recommendation for things like patty cups? So um, Pam, we're hope you're able to connect with Tanya um, over at the art um, so you can, you know, some some advocacy can be put into that that voice that you were able to, to share with us. We really, really appreciate that. And um, you're welcome. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. So next we have, um, Ben has asked um, Sarah to relay a situation to us for us to discuss and hear more about. Absolutely. I'm going to speak to Ben. Hi, Ben. And hi, Sarah. I want to do that forever. Well, you did a great job, Pam. You were muted, but we wanted to tell you, you did a great job. Okay, and so we have, there we go. We have you unmuted now. Wait, hang on one second, Sarah. We can't hear you. We know you're unmuted, but we can't actually, I can see your lips moving, but the sound is off. Can't hear you now. I'm reading your lips, but can't hear you now. Is your um your is your mic off on mute on your computer? Okay. My technology usually ends around there. Um, we can still I can see your lips moving. I cannot hear what you're saying. So Sarah, check your audio settings on your computer itself. That's it, Sabrina. You got it. <laughs> You'd think I, and I teach online. I just tell the students log on, log back. We'll try it again. <laughs> I have no benefits. Y'all are seeing me in this. Um, um, Sarah Stan, can you select me as a speaker? Okay, yeah. We just, so you're back on mute now. Sarah and Ben, we're back on mute. So try to unmute now. Let's try to unmute again and see. Still not, we're still muted and the camera's off. So we'll give you a second. Um, let's make sure we'll give you a second to try and. Technology works and then it doesn't, right? That's just technology where it works at 2 p.m. It doesn't at 2.17 p.m. That is, that is literally technology. Um, but we as a community are going to get through this journey together today. Um, I can move over. Um, I can move over um, our next comments and then we can. Yeah, I think they logged out. So anyway, so they're probably logged back in. So, so Amitri is getting ready to come up. 
Okay. Hi, Amitri, how are you? And you just have to unmute Amitri and then, okay. there we go. Hello, how are you? Wow, that was like amazing. Um, I'm fine, thank you for giving me a moment. Um, this has been really educational. I am part of the work group on the Marcus Alert for Culpepper. And I'm learning a lot. I have a lot of concerns. I am thrilled to be a part of this. If you're not aware, we just had um, a shooting of a gentleman here who had post-traumatic stress syndrome. One of our law enforcement agencies was called out. We have two. We have the sheriff's department and the town police who coexist locally here within the town of Culpeper. The sheriff's department was called out. Um, they have not received any training. The town police have. Um, there was a gun involved. Um, the sheriff's department is not releasing any information. Um, this gentleman who had served honorably as a veteran was known as a father. Um, I won't say how people in my community knew him. Um, and um, it has come out allegedly, he did fire the gun. Some people say he brandished the weapon. He died very quickly in the incident. And it was a mental health issue. People do agree about that. Um, we had a similar incident three months ago here. So this is a, a current issue for us. Um, and especially with the African-American community. Um, the town police have received training. They're handling these incidences so far pretty well. Um, we had an incident, there was no gun, but there was a weapon. It was de-escalated um, and it worked out. But one of my real concerns is funding for training. One of the pushbacks we're going to receive is if there is no money available for law enforcement and others to receive training, that is gonna be an answer to the issue, especially where there is reluctance. If there's no money given to receive training, even with the money being given, just the things I've heard today on the laundry list of issues needed for training. Um, that's gonna be difficult. Um, the other issue is depending on where you're living, we're in a region with no mental health beds, none, just none. So it creates a real crisis for what happens and trying to get someone to separate and even just get evaluated peacefully um, when they know they're gonna get transported um, is horrible. When there are no beds, when there's no care, someone brought up about psychiatric afterwards. Let's say we just get you quick, quickly evaluated, go home, but the only care available is CSB in your community and there's no other providers. We have approximately one provider. I have a person in my family who needs care for depression. She drives 45 miles. She's an essential worker. Getting time off for that is, is, is crazy. Thank God for telehealth, but that's not everything. Um, I do work with the Disability Resource Center who's trying, trying, to bring a center for independent living to the four counties I serve. There is not one here. Rappahannock, Culpeper, Madison, and Orange do not have a center for independent living. So in a sense, um, that creates an even greater vacuum for resources for people with disability. And it's not just autism. Many people with disabilities, when they're having any type of difficulty with mental health, behavioral health issues, 
can be mistaken for violent. Just, we have a person here with cerebral palsy. I know because people are fearful of him, just fearful of his appearance. He's African-American and people are fearful of his appearance. They have called law enforcement. Anytime law enforcement is called, there is potential for violence because guns are involved. So that is, I mean, that is a beginning list. And a lot of this goes back to training. I'm lucky in the sense that because I'm an attorney, because I worked with Department of Social Services, CSB, I have a master's in conflict analysis and resolution, which includes the de-escalation. I work with Disability Resource Center. Just that it doesn't make me qualified to do anything, but it gives me a breath of recognizing issues. People, we live in silos and people don't see. And so these listening sessions, you know, are important. So people begin to see outside their silos. And I wish, you know, I can't see who's here, but a lot of people need to be here hearing from the community. So we start to, I have a whole list. The handcuffs issue, I have forgotten about. Nobody, nobody. Handcuffs and shackles. She should be speaking to the General Assembly. That is ridiculous and it's inappropriate. So thank you, too much time, but thank you. No, that wasn't, that, no, that wasn't too much time. Thank you very much. Um, so a lot of what I heard is not just funding and availability, but making sure the actual providers are recognizing some of our underserved populations um, and come in actual geographic locations. Um, and then also too, there were, really educating entire communities. Because one of the things you're saying is that a person who is having difficulty distinguishing um, a person who is differently abled from labeling them as aggressive and then calling law enforcement, there's an increased risk of a negative interaction that's rooted in something, that's rooted in bias. Um, and so I thank you for sharing that and being able to identify where there are threats to the systems of care. Um, or lack of the system of care. Um, and, and in some of our rural communities as well. And so I, I think that's really important to acknowledge um, or individuals have to drive so far or have to go so far to, to be able to get to a provider because we know telehealth at some point in time will, will not look the same. Um, and so then we, we go back into the same cycle of having a lack of accessibility to care. And so I think you're, you're forecasting what those concerns will be in the very near future um, when telehealth is not something that every provider is able to offer. Very, very accurate. Thank you for that. Um, and that definitely was not too long. That was really necessary, really appropriate. And I think very concrete identification of challenges and deficits and threats to the system of care for individuals um, culturally, intellectually and then emotionally as well. Thank you for that. I am going to now transition over to Sabrina, uh, our co-facilitator today. Um, I, I would say to everyone who I've had a chance to speak with, I am honored to really talk with you all. And I thank you all for sharing things with us that, that is very vulnerable. Um, and I don't say that to be like counselor cheeky. I say that genuinely, I hope you feel that I am genuine when I say that. That is an honored space um, to hear the privilege of your shared lived experiences and those vulnerabilities. And so I thank you all for that. And I'm going to transfer over to Sabrina. Thank you, Tasha. Tanya, are you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to see if you want to take a couple of the things from the chat box and share. Um, some of the comments that are coming in have been covered in people's verbal comments, but I will share. Uh, there's a note from someone who says, my son was TDO'd, ECO'd 10 times in five years. I've spoken to the General Assembly and I've been advocating for change for the past five years. My battle is the same as others who have the same stories from 10 years ago. How long do we need to wait for change? It seems like all we do is talk. 
We can hear the frustration coming through in your voice. And I know that there are many people who have those same feelings and experiences. And I, I know everyone here hopes that this is not just talk and that everyone's yes. committed to doing as much as possible. Um, there was some conversation and questions about whether there were alternatives, soft items that were alternative to handcuffs. Um, and some folks here may know more about that, but I think someone put in the, someone answered that question, one of the uh, members here on the call um, saying that there is an option for soft handcuffs. And so maybe that should be considered. Um, soft restraints, yes. Um, and I think that was it. The rest, most are things that people have been saying. So thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Tanya. All right, Mary, welcome. Um, happy to hear your comments. Putting on the picture, hold on. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, I just wanted to share uh, a lived experience as a parent. <laughs> so um, my son's lived experience. I received the phone call um, July, 2018 um, for something that was our first time. So it was a manic episode, New York City. And I had a phone call from my son while the triage, while the protocol was going on uh, and not really knowing what was, was going on. But the bottom line is that the police force in Brooklyn had a protocol and had the CIT training. And instead of going to the police station, he was taken to a psychiatric unit at Elmhurst in Brooklyn. And I want that opportunity for everyone, for everyone who needs it, everyone. Uh, and because of that, I'm, I'm growing into um, an advocate role that, that will be authentic for me and I appreciate um, being on this call. So for me, the bottom line is we at least need the CIT training and the protocol. We at least need that. And I don't think in Virginia we have at least that. So that's for me kind of a baseline. In addition, in our experience, we were um, in a college age group in this case 25, but still considered college age for the rest of the protocols that transpired over a 24 hour period. So I think Dimitri pointed out that we have no beds <laughs> in mm. Virginia. Um, New York was full in a place that was not the best place, but they had the protocol. I did not have to, uh, you know, four and a half hours away uh, work this, except that I was given information as to a bed had become available at an appropriate facility for someone who was college age. And I, I think that is another piece, whether it's tailored to age groups, which may be, sound like a luxury, certainly wonderful if you can get it. So mm -hmm. maybe the baseline is a step back from that to have a bed in the first place with all of the appropriate protocols, not simply a bed, but the care that we expect to go around with that bed. But there are certainly steps beyond that that can be taken. Um, and I, I just wanted to make sure that I did share my voice um, and re recognize that um, maybe the role of advocacy as you go forward with the plan um, can be very helpful. It takes a village. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mary, for sharing that. So uh, absolutely um, your lived experience and what you bring to that and then how that shows up in your recommendations of things for us 
to be mindful of. So it sounds like one, having some, um, making sure that all of our uh, police officers are trained across the state um, and CIT, not just one region or, or another region, but all of them, um, ensuring that we have some clear protocols for how we engage um, crisis at the point of contact and then also through the process of hospitalization and next steps, um, specifically looking at hospital beds. So do we have enough beds and where are they? And do, do folks know how to connect to them? But then also um, I heard this, the unique need for um, some specific training across the lifespan. So what does mental health and wellness or mental health issues look like at different levels, whether it is um, as a child or a college age student or an adult? Does that sound about, did I get, a, get them all? That, that sounds wonderful. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you so much for sharing. So we have Ben and Mary, Ben and Sarah to try again, if that works. So you're muted now. I know how you're feeling. I know you do this all the time and it works perfect, Sarah. Uh, ben <laughs> and I, we're on meetings together all the time and you, uh, no, oh goodness, no. And it doesn't make sense because you're unmuted. Oh my goodness. Somehow your internal microphone is turned off. Someone did mm -hmm. ask earlier, do you have um, headphones or anything like that plugged in by mis Um, I'm sorry. Thank you. She says, move on, move on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. So I'm just going to catch this comment from um, Amitri in the chat. So we need to stop labeling every older adult with health issues as dementia. Absolutely. Um, and, and making that part of the process. So um, appropriate diagnoses of the folks that show up for care. So Lisa is just asking um, for our attendees who's present tonight, if there's anyone else that would like to share, you all have done just an amazing job of sharing your lived experience and your ideas about um, how we move forward and some specific recommendations um, that I think we are, I know that we are taking notes on. I'm also over here taking notes, so we will um, use that information. And then Natasha is saying, Sarah, if you, would you maybe just want to to chat it and I can read it out loud. We don't hear you, no. Yeah. And if I'm <laughs> recalling, this is something that Ben has shared with me before, but I would not remember the details, but it's a story. So I, I will leave that to you, Sarah and Ben, of whether that's easy to get uh, in, into comments. If you put some highlights, I might remember some of it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Sarah's going to get the other laptop. We'll see if that works. Um, and then I'm just noting that Lisa is saying, so as we sort of close out the comment section, if there are not other folks that want to um, make comment, this is also can be a space where we just have conversation about, I think, the work that the work group has done, um, other lived experiences that you all might want to share. So any just open conversation, if there's anyone who maybe wants to engage that, if you would also just let us know, um, share that in the chat as well. Lisa, perhaps what might be helpful as we're um, waiting for Sarah to see if she can get logged back in is just to, to maybe talk about what we've done as a work group so far, or do we have, do we have another person for comment? Yeah, that's um yeah, so we have um Victoria and then and then uh, that's a great idea. Victoria. Welcome Victoria. If you unmute yourself and 
and share. We'll be happy to hear. I see half of a micro microphone down there. Um, <laughs> yes, I have a lot of lived experience. My son has a schizophrenia diagnosis and he lives in an old house, our old house on our property and it's a pretty good situation. But uh, his last hospitalization, um, it worked out pretty well because I had called the uh, region 10 is my area. And uh, the I had called and talked to someone who serves like as an evaluator you know, the same person who would meet you at the hospital, um, you know, after, or meet with the, your loved one at the hospital. And I was thinking with the Marcus alert, if, and it might, uh, oh, darn. Oh. Mm. Help. We can still hear you. Just oh, okay. You think you muted yourself. I can still okay, hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, the, you know, we're all divided here into regions, into health districts. Like, you, just like the vaccinations are going through health districts, um, maybe the Marcus Alert could go through um, that, because there are so many small counties with very few deputies, especially at mm -hmm. night. You know, and until they get the training and it just depends, you know, training can be scheduled at different times, but when they have a mental health call, they could um, get in touch with an evaluator at their local CSB and that CS, the person there would be able to look up if he's a, you know, if he's a consumer at that CSB and be able to, you know, maybe give some input to the, uh, you know, the police at the time. Uh, because police tend to want to do things fast and our people can't process very quickly when they're psychotic. And it just keeps me uh, very upset to see some of these um, murders by police really is what they are. Uh, that uh, you would, would you, you know, of people in a mental health crisis uh, would you treat someone who is having a seizure like that? I doubt it. Uh, you know, and it's uh, just to be, but police want to do things fast. And that's not, uh, you know, that's not conducive to someone in a psychotic state. They can barely understand directions or much less respond to them quickly. So if they could get in touch with evaluators, Maybe, you know, there's a, a history there, you know, it would be open to that. We have computers, we have cell phones now, you know, the cell phone, maybe somebody from the CSB could talk to the person in distress. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a, a whole new world, but we def definitely have to be doing something different. And I was glad to see the Marcus Alert come into effect, really. And it's time to consider this. Yeah, thank, so thank you, you, Victoria. Thank you for sharing. So I'm, I'm hearing, um, I think two really important themes. So one, which was the second theme, but I, it was just really lovely how you said that. So police need to slow down. So as we're looking at our policy and procedure, so how do we slow down that process so that the right folks are responding um, to a need as it occurs um, in the community? And then that the piece of evaluators or someone who is able to say, so can we check in when a call is made um, and identify is this person a previous consumer? What is their mental health history? How do we best engage this person um, when we go to respond or even do we respond or do we send someone else um, rather than a police officer? You got it. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right, um, Sarah, we're gonna try again. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Welcome. Hey. Well, Ben just said he wants to go take a nap, but I'm uh, Sarah Bro, and this is Ben. Ben, you can sit, or I'll just represent you if you need me to, but if you could sit for a sec, that'd be great. Um, he is a non-speaking autistic, and while we were off screen, he wrote a bunch of stuff, but it could take a very long time for him to use the letterboard 
while we're talking. So he just asked me to bring up a couple of points. Um, one is that um, he wondered if anybody had heard about, first he said the presentations have been very powerful and so raw and real and thank you everyone. Um, he also wondered if anybody had talked about hospitals having cultural humility training Okay. which is something new that we found out because um, his aunt, my sister, is a community services person for a hospital up in Boston, and she's been doing cultural humility training up there. And um, Ben wanted to introduce that to this in another state committee that he's on. Um, and um, the story that Tiny was talking about is one day um, we came home and Ben was sitting out front and a gentleman was in our front yard. And at first he appeared kind of scary to us because why is this man standing in our front yard? And then just because I'm very familiar with it, I was able to tell that he was autistic and he was actually minimally speaking. And um, he um, had walked on the highways four miles from where his group home was having a field trip in a shopping center. And he was very scared and very frustrated. And I said, would it be okay if I called the police to help you? And he started to scream, the police are horrible. The police are horrible. They're going to take me away. They're going to take me away. And, um, but I said, I think I need to do it for your safety. And he started walking away. So I called the police and I think they were very responsive, but they also had four cars show up at one time. Uh -huh. And, um, he said, and I had talked to him about Ben and Ben had said, you know, I can't remember his name or whatever, but Ben said, I will talk to you and help you with the police. And so Ben acted as a conduit to help them better understand how this gentleman was so upset. And they really did listen. And this young, this young man was able because he felt he had a peer here. So Ben's question was, we talk a lot about mental health, people in recovery peers, but what kind of peers are there for people mm. with ID and DD and autism? Because as he said, that could have gone completely the other way because the gentleman was very agitated. It could have gone completely the other way if it hadn't very much serendipitously happened in our front yard. So um, he wanted to convey that story. Um, and along those lines, he also has brought up, because it came up there, when the, when the police showed up, they're like, oh, we know person A, this has happened before. And Ben said, well, do you have on file other people who might be vulnerable like him? Can we, and then he's talked about a voluntary registration of people who think that they would be at risk with interaction with the police for not being understood. And not mandatory, but voluntary for communities to be able to have that. He's presented it before. And um, so that, like Ben asked me to say, and he's, Tanya's heard this many times, if Ben was in a situation, he's totally non-speaking, even minimal non-speaking people will start to say things or make behaviors just because they're simply so upset they can't convey their true feelings. Mm -hmm. And as Ben has said, and Tanya, you've heard this, it would be an utter nightmare if I was somewhere where people didn't understand. So the other thing that he was wanted to have be discussed is the right of a person such as him uh, minimal or non-speaking autistic or a person with a DD to have someone with them. As Pam said, she was able there to be with her son. Yes. A lot of times um, that's not that's something that they've been fighting for just for medical reasons, like pure medical reasons, but to have, if he didn't have somebody there who understood him and could communicate with him, nothing would happen except for a horror story. So that was the other thing he wanted me to convey to all of you. And there he is. Yeah. So I want to first say, Ben, thanks for hanging in there. Um, so we can get audio fixed and, and hopefully you can now go take your nap. Um, but some really good things just bought up and for us to um, recognize and put into our, our policy planning. I'm not familiar with cultural humility training, um, but certainly something that we can we can look at. Are you Atasha? Yeah. Okay. I am. That's a great suggestion. Um, okay that I think not just for law enforcement, for providers, for hospitals, et cetera, there's a lot of work that's being done with that. I know there was a question about like methodology, et cetera. I would even maybe recommend including some of those trainings and scales. Um, and, and just to explain, it's, it's, it really is a good way of making sure you're able to address and gatekeep for like implicit bias and how it impacts decision-making. Um, and so it, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, and implicit bias is not just something that's linked to race or ethnicity. 
Um, it can be linked to a person who is differently abled, lower socioeconomic status, rural versus living in the city. Um, you know, all of those things that that I think um, a cultural humility scale or similar scales are really designed to do that. So that's a really great suggestion, I think, to, to put in. And when you link that into to the methods in, in which we're doing it, because I, I know some of the concerns are like, so when when do we leave from just talking, taking those type of scales and including that in training, et cetera, and gatekeeping, I think is, is how we're all linking this together. Um, ben said he's very impressed by Moved and Moved by Everyone. And thank you very much. And if you want to connect with his aunt, he will, who does this up in Boston, he will do that. And the other thing that he wanted to mention today is, um, and this, this is how the whole cultural humility discussion came up. I believe it was in his this meeting the other day, and he referred to himself as an autistic. And somebody came into the chat and referred to him as you mean a person with autism. And um, Ben is going to send an email, but about how it's how people decide to choose to, to yes. the way yes. people decide to mm -hmm. describe themselves is the way that they need to be re be respected as being described. Um, yeah, I saw that too. Good, good job, Ben. Yes, I, yes. I, I, I saw that. Ben. So Thank and you. um and I I saw it, and then we kept going. Um, but good job, Ben, with identifying that. And it's how a person, and there were several individuals who are members of the autistic community who that is how they identified. And that's the space that we hold okay. for that. So it, it does link together. So good good job with that. And um, you want to say goodbye? good way to speak up for that. Okay. <laughs> bye, Ben. All right, I bye, can't bye, take ben. a nap. Listen. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, it's good snap time. But I want to make sure, though, too, that we don't miss the other things that um, Ben brought up. So one of them, as we are looking at um, peer supports that maybe engage um, those who address a crisis when it happens. So also identifying not um, just folks who have substance abuse or mental health issues, but also those from the ID and DD population to be a part of those peer support or community um, support. Um, folks, and then the voluntary registry. So if we can have a place where folks can say, I want to be able to share my experience and, and what I am diagnosed with and how best to engage me, um, I, I really appreciate the, the concept of that being voluntary. So you are not forced to do this, um, but if we create it and you, and you want to voluntarily share that information, if we can make that um, a consideration. And then just the presence of a support um, in my own professional work, actually, I see this often with folks who are ID and DD who don't have someone in the emergency room with them. And so if that's the thing that we can consider in the process, whether it's ID, DD, substance abuse, um, so that they can say, someone can advocate and say, I need someone else to be here with me while I'm with this doctor or this police officer or this um, psychiatrist, mental health professional um, to help me, to help walk me through this journey. I think that was all of them. So do it, um, I can talk a little bit about kind of the process so far and then we can, um, if others, so if, if, you're, if you're not a, a panelist now um, and you're in attendee mode, just put your name in the chat and I'll move you over so you can um, speak. And then um, for other work group members or people that are on panelist mode, just, um, you know, just, just join in and, and add whatever you think is important. Um, so, so the way we're kind of approaching the planning, um, take calling it sort of a three-phase process, um, going through exploring, understanding, and deciding. Um, and so for the first four, yeah, definitely five, but it might go into the sixth meeting, um, the idea was to um, get what we consider input. So having presentations on the different kind of um, angles of this complex issue um, and trying to pull together just information from from different sources from all the different stakeholders. Um, and so the idea is kind of, you know, we don't have to make any decisions. We don't have to be, um, you know, deciding anything. Just try to get the information, try to get every perspective and all the information on the table. Um, and then when we feel like we have that, we kind of say, um, it's sort of like you say, you're trying to get all the needs on the table. So like in a way we're gonna, hopefully in the next week or two, we're gonna have a, a long list of needs and the needs are like, um, you know, we need, um, you know, you could say, we need the system to result in um, more diversions. Um, 
or we need to make sure that what we do, we don't have unintended consequences of more law enforcement involvement, or we need to make sure that, um, that we include a lot of peer recovery specialists. So things like that. So essentially getting a lot of needs on the table um, and then from there, try to kind of, um, kind of scope it out. Um, we've been forming some subgroups that are gonna um, be writing proposals during that next phase. We call it explore. Um, and essentially, so some of the subgroups that, so this is the community input subgroup um, that you're with today. The One of the really big ones that's coming up, it's almost an overarching one, is the concept of triage. So um, if we're, if a big focus is going to be diverting people from 911 all the way to behavioral health without um, any additional law enforcement involvement, you know, it's really that triage function. And then, you know, at other levels, um, you know, what is the triage and what are the protections that, um, that we want to put into the state plan? What are the requirements that we're going to have at the local level? Um, so this kind of overarching concept of triage and how do we think about risk and how do we take bias out of our concepts of risk? Um, and then we have um, we're going to have a, a best practice in CIT and co-response. So essentially some of those like law enforcement trainings and law enforcement focused um, interventions. Um, they're kind of going to start a work stream. We have um, really looking at trying to make sure that we actually have culturally competent, peer-led, Black-led crisis services. Um, because if we you know, we're taking a systems approach and we know that there's racism and behavioral health too. So we actually, you know, need to actually build those services up. And we consider that to be part of the Marcus Alert, making sure that those services are in the community. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the state plan does involve ways to, um, to invest in those services and build those services up. Um, and so the local roadmap is another subgroup. So essentially the idea of, you know, we're, we're going to have the state framework, but then um, like who approves, who approves the applications? How do you, um, how are they monitored? What, um, how much community input does the locality have to get before they write their plan? You know, so stuff like that, essentially like kind of um, the roadmap piece. And so that's, um, that's, that's kind of essentially that's that'll get us through getting proposals on the table and then really we're in a decide phase we're not. Um, we don't have any plan right now to vote by consensus, um, but it's you know it's possible that we could um, do a voting by consent or voting by consensus type process, depending on you know the, the goal is to get all the proposals on the table and synthesize them into one plan that's the goal. Um, and so we don't know what um, we don't know exactly if it's going to be. Um, you know how that's going to look during the decide phase, but we're going to try our best to um, provide information information out to the community um, and then continue to receive information. Um, so a couple um, in the chat, so we have how is law enforcement being heard? Yeah, and so we have, um, I would say that we have um, really good law enforcement participation in the group. Um, our partner at Department of Criminal Justice Services he um, helped select the work group members um, for the law enforcement representative. So he made sure that there was um, um, like what he calls um, boots on the ground from rural areas, boots on the ground from urban areas, leadership from rural areas, um, leadership from urban areas. So I think that we have, um, you know, good, we have um, many sheriffs who are who are interested, um, a police chief, a police officer. So I think that we have good, um, I think that we have good engagement on the law enforcement side in the work group. Um, that's a good question. And you said how many attendees today? So it, it was 35 when it was at its most. So I would say it's a good turnout, but also that we can do, it was a really good turnout for today. Um, and, and also we can do more and make sure that we're, um, you know, that we get it accessible so that we can you know, just hearing the comments today, it's almost given us even more questions. Um, we're, you know, we're inching towards the other plan, but it's giving us even more questions um, as well. And so I, I did want to add, so we have the three, um, the three meetings on the front end, and then we have, um, we're going to be doing kind of some of the writing and the planning, and then, and there will be a community survey that's going to go out. So essentially kind of getting a little bit more detailed information, you know, for example, so a lot of the things we've talked about today, you know, um, things about 
law enforcement, hospital settings, you're really kind of trying to really dig into the details of what families um, and individuals are, you know, looking for in a response. Um, and then essentially we'll have probably two meetings later on in the process. And at that point we'll be more giving information out. Um, you know, we're kind of, we kind of said anything we get before April 1st, we won't have anything written by then. So we can feel confident it'll be in at the ground level, but after that, we'll kind of be in writing mode. So we'll um, definitely try it. We'll have at least two meetings to keep folks updated. But at that point, we will be um, kind of, if we if we have progressed in the plan, then we'll be able to share more of that. Thanks, Dimitri. Do you want to share um, anything about your, so, um, so glad that you're on this call as a, um, you know, so there's five areas that are implementing by December. So they've formed their work groups. Um, probably in the last month or so. Do you want to share a little bit about the local planning? Um, we're just getting ourselves together. Literally, we're just meeting for the first time on Wednesday or Thursday. But I just want to um, say that we're being kind of scientific, scientific, wow, late in the day, S scientific about how we're putting our group together um, intentionally. Um, we are having representatives because we're rural, um, so there's police and sheriffs in each jurisdiction, at least one representative from each of those groups, representative from the um, Commonwealth Attorney's Office, because um, they're really important to making this work. Um, and we're open to expanding the work group. Um, you know, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, we really need people from dispatch. Um, and I just thought about that as sitting here, we got to go back and make sure we have people from dispatch because we have to make sure as we're thinking through this, this is workable for them. So I'm making a note to call um, Jen LeGraff, who's our director and say, are any of these people connected to dispatch? Because they've got to be able to do this. Um, I will say, um, I just reached out we're trying to get diversity and even though, and I don't want this to be lost, the Marcus Alert was about the shooting of a black man. And that cannot be lost in all of what we're trying to do. That has to be addressed. At the same time, diversity. All of us come from diverse communities. In Culpeper, um, we have a large Hispanic community. Many of them are not English speaking. So I was listening to Ben and saying, wow, we need to address that. And I love this listening session. I'm trying to think, wow, I think we need to do this somehow. Our biggest problem is distance. Fauquier County end to end is over 75 miles. <sighs> That's, that's just distance. You know, um, Rappahannock, Rappahannock, Dan, it, these are, you know, some of these regions that we're asking CSB to cover are huge and they're diverse. You know, and that's something we're trying to address, but I really appreciate this. Um, is these ideas, I mean, I'm glad I'm sitting in because I'm just stealing the ideas. Well, and I, I think too, though, you're not stealing them, right? So I love that there is representation from a smaller work group that's connected to this larger work group that we're creating because that's part of the goal is that we create this universal narrative. We create a more um, centralized approach to how we engage X, Y, and Z. And so it makes sense that you would follow the recommendations and or take from these recommendations and find ones that fit for Culpeper in your region. And I think that dispatch discussion is so vital. I was just thinking about that, Amisha, when you talked about that, like I, I grew up in a rural area, so I grew up in New Kent. So we just have, we have the sheriff's office. That's, that's it. Um, but I do think about the the call, I, I'm not the, you know, dispatch is who determines and codes the call. And, and so um, certainly in our community, 
the officers knew a lot of us growing up. We went to school together, but that's changed as the county has grown. And so they may know at this house, there's a person who is living with autism. And, and so they, they get that call and they respond or they send a different deputy, right? Maybe there's a good working relationship. That's, a, that's, that's not common. That's just growing up in a small, you know, small rural area. But then as you grow, you lose that connection. And so I think about then how does dispatch code the call and how do we introduce a part of that plan to make sure that even when it gets to, by the time it gets to the officer, it's an accurate description of the call. Um, because that could change what officer goes, the approach, et cetera, or should change that. Um, and so I think that's really vital that even bringing in representatives from dispatch just into the planning session to make sure while we're doing trainings, you have to train each person who is an entry point for that individual. And dispatch really starts that relationship, that interaction that's going to happen with law enforcement. So that's just such an important part to include. Well, I was going to add that um, I think along with that, Joe put another comment in the chat box related to what Ben had said. Um, so if it is at that beginning part, when you have someone identified already through a volunteer registry, that can help alert um, the dispatchers uh, to the situation because uh, Joe shares that in his community, they had cards where people could pull out to identify, but that can be very tricky, um, particularly uh, for people of color, uh, you know, so this could be someone with autism, someone who doesn't speak English. It could be all kinds of reasons that you need to pull a card because uh, you, you're not able to communicate in that moment. Um, so I think that's a really important key. Thank you. So other comments, thoughts, um, questions that you all might have as attendees that we can address while we're here together? And if not, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to usher us on our ways. <laughs> So I'll put, I'm putting, I'm just going to put the Marcus Alert email address in um, the chat so that if you, um, uh, if you have other ideas, um, then you can, you know, we, we check that email box every day and anything, um, let me just make sure I got it right. Um, anything that comes in before April 1st, that'll be before we start writing. And then even after that, we'll, we'll definitely still be, you know, reviewing and everything, but we will be we'll have, um, you know, pen to paper at that point. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, just so grateful for, um, for all of you, you know, for coming and for all the um, sharing that you've done um, and all these important points that you've raised. Um, I'm gonna pass it and see if anyone else in the work group wants to speak up. Um, I know Princess, we have Princess Blanding, um, the sister of Marcus David Peters is, um, been so gracious to be part of the work group um, and is helping us on the project. So I didn't know if you wanted to um, to say anything. We so appreciate you being here um, or anyone else on the work group. Sure. Um, I want to thank everyone who was brave enough to make themselves vulnerable by sharing your stories. And I've been over here writing lots and lots of notes because so many great points were made. And, you know, the markers alert uh, was born out of the unjust murder of Marcus. And, you know, what we know is that we can't bring Marcus back, but we absolutely have the ability to ensure that any other individual that's experiencing a mental health crisis receives help, not death. And as clearly stated on this call, that includes our population that has disabilities. You know, I am a educator and I have de-escalated countless uh, situations in school, many with my children who, you know, uh, you know, have emotional issues or intellectual disabilities and harm has never been a consideration. And so we must make sure that that spreads out in our communities as well. And, you know, your voices are heard, you know, great, great feedback. And, you know, I look forward to working very, very closely uh, with this team and with current and future administration to ensure that this bill is crafted right relationships is a huge part of the equation. And regardless as to a person's, you know, uh, intellectual status or their emotional status, they're human first. 
right? And we must keep that at the forefront. Nothing else is that important, you know, or goes over the fact that we are dealing with human life. And, you know, I heard people speaking about language barriers and how that can be a problem. You know, one thing that I made note of is for our nonverbal community members, right? Even if like in education, we use like a peg system, right? Mm -hmm. For some of our students. So even if you're going to grab for your system or your tools that you've been taught to use, that could be a life, that could, that could be a game changer. That could be a life sentence, right? A death sentence, excuse me. So it's very important that we take into deep consideration as this, as this uh, Marcus Alert system is being crafted, those voices that are living this every single day, right? And that we make sure that we're putting humanity first. So again, I thank everyone uh, you know, for speaking out and, and sharing your stories. And I look forward to us getting this bill right. Thank you. All right, well, if anyone, if um, there aren't any further comments, um, we'll just thank you again um, for your time. Um, please consider, you know, either attending another forum or um, once the community survey comes out, whatever, however you heard about this one, we're gonna try our best to get the survey to every path that got this ad should also get the survey. So there will be a chance um, to fill that survey out so that we can, you know, kind of get some, um, you know, just a little more detailed look at some of these points. We're, we're not gonna finalize the survey till after these sessions so that, you know, you guys have given us a lot of things to think about tonight in terms of things that we need to add to the survey. Uh, we'll try not to make it too long though. Um, so, so thanks again. Um, and we, we are so appreciative of you coming and sharing with us tonight. Thank you. Everyone have a happy Sunday. <laughs> Thank you. I thought that went well. Have a great one. <laughs> so that was really good. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you all so much. Oh my goodness, the panelists so appreciate it. Aaron, that went really well. That was, and it was like 35, 40. I was, I was surprised. That was, that was a lot of people. Um, so who all spoke. So I thought that was really helpful. So I just want to let you know that <laughs> I know it's a lot for you. This is like high stake stuff, right? <laughs> I know it's a lot. And so I just want to let you know, great job. I think that this was really authentic and real. So I, I think that people walked away from it um, ready to have real discussion. So that was good. So yeah, thank you so, so much for doing this. This is, um, this has been great. No problem. Enjoy your Sunday. Get back to the kids. Okay. All right. Talk to <laughs> Have a good one. Bye.